everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we've got the gameplay, the first part in our gameplay video series for War for Indigar. Now, this is a game that plays up to four players, but it does have built-in solo rules right there in the back of the rule book. Does not change too much, basically just pits you against these monsters that are part of the main game as well. But in this case, they'll be your only opponents. I've had uh, a good bit of fun in learning this one. Really enjoy it. Really want to play it with more players, though, see how that plays as well. But we're going to get right down the table and we'll show you how this plays solo. Now, I do want to mention our sponsor, Board Game Co. This is a fantastic website for you to go to where you can buy, sell, and trade games. If you are looking to buy some new games, you need to just build out your collection. They can help you out with that. Great games great prices if you need to get rid of some games but you're not looking to bring any more more games in you can sell games over there they have uh, really good prices and a really good system to help you out with that they also though trade games as well they have a whole system set up for that and the best part is they can link into your board game geek account so be sure to check out board game co uh, where you can buy sell and trade your way into a better collection okay let's get down to the table and i'll show you uh how this solo game of war for indigar is going to work all right, so here we go. This is the board setup for War for Indigar when you're playing solo. Now, each uh, number of players has a different board setup. So uh, you, you'll actually, you know, depending on if you got one, two, three, or four players, you're going to be coming at lots of different angles here, starting from different spots. But this is the one player setup right here. You can see over here, uh, you always start with a level two outpost on your gold mine. So we've got gold there. Uh, and then here we have a ore mine. Or, and then over here we have a forest where I can get wood. I can harvest wood from that. And this level two outpost will give me two gold every round. At the, at the end of the round when the outposts produce whatever it is that they are making. Here are my three heroes, and we'll uh, get into them here in just a second. They're standing on three just plains areas. There's there's no, nothing special about the land that they're on there. The rest of this is all flipped face down. And as I explore, I'll start flipping them face up. And there is a very specific number of different types of tiles in here. The, the layout is random. And, uh, you know, so for instance, there's, there's two more gold mines in here somewhere, two... Uh, lumber, two ore mines, three mountains, which are impassable. Uh, let's see, we've got four mud tiles and 11 grasslands, which I called plains a second ago, but they're called grasslands, and then 12 event tiles. Now, the event tiles have all kinds of different effects, and there's more event tiles than the 12 that are here, so I'm not even sure exactly what events are out here. This right here is the well, uh, the well of power is what that's called. And basically, that's going to be giving me uh, a certain number of, or, or every every round, a spirit cube is going to be placed on there. And then I can go up there and harvest those spirit cubes and use them for various things. Also, this monster up here is primarily going to be focusing on collecting those spirit cubes as well. So let's talk about the monsters for a second. These are the guys that are going to be causing me problems in the solo game, and they're going to be actively working against me, but they also work against each other as well. They're not friends with each other. If they end up next to each other, they will attack each other. Uh, here, down here, we have the Blighter uh, Tijian, or Tijian. And you can see, uh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll go through all of this targeting information as we play the game. Uh, but and these power-ups down here, as, as the rounds go by, these monsters will get more and more powerful. And you can see the stats here, two movement, two attack, meaning it'll use two dice to attack, two defense, and six health. But as far as, like I said, the specific targeting stuff we'll go through when we start playing. But generally speaking, this monster is going to focus on coming after resource tiles and destroying them. This guy over here is Name Unknown Spirit Walker. His main goal is to target me and my guys down here and not like that. But the more abilities that I use, the more powerful that the spirit walker gets so that can become a real problem real fast up here we have 
the Enchantress, Oriana, who I already mentioned, she's going to be focusing mainly on getting spirits from the Well of Power. And you know, she has one movement, zero attack, but that's because she actually automatically wins attacks. Three defense, six health. I didn't show you the Spirit Walker's stuff. We didn't run through it real quick. Uh, two movement, two attack, one defense, and ten health. Now that two attack is is uh, deceiving because the his attack is actually what gets upgraded every time I use an ability. And then over here we have the Marauder Helgoth. So this guy, two movement, three attack, one defense, six health. His main goal is to come after my outposts. All right, so I'm going to put I'll put these miniatures next to their cards so you can see them as we go through them. So the River Saver over here is the one that I have. Uh, Zotked is his name. He is the River Saver. Uh, he's the one that I've chosen as my leader or commander, I believe is what he's called, which is why he's going to start as level two. And his level one upgrade was that he gets an ex extra defense. So he'll be two movement, three attack, two defense, and six health. He also has the charge ability, which lets him move and attack uh, a little bit easier. Well, well, I basically gets an extra movement as long as he then attacks at the end of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's how that rule works. We'll double check it once we get into the gameplay here. He has a number of special abilities, so let's look at those real quick. So his basic ability, spend one gold, Blind Fury, Zotked has plus one attack. The command ability, which is only able to be used if he's the commander, which as I said, he is. Um, it's always available is what that means. Wilder Packs, Zotked grants plus two attack when providing a flanking bonus instead of plus one attack. So flanking bonus is when he's next to an enemy that another of my heroes is attacking. Then his special abilities down here, Primal Rage, one gold, Zot may reroll two dice, counterattack, two wood, and one ore, always available. A friendly hero adjacent to Zok that is attacked but not sent into retreat may immediately attack its attacker. And then Berserker. One wood, one gold, one ore. Zotked may attack once in addition to his other actions this turn. All right, and then we have uh, Arzella Hemen, the cold wind. Two movement, two attack, two defense, six health. Special rule tough, which means that when they, all my heroes naturally heal one wound, uh, one hit point every round, but she will actually heal two. The basic ability, spend one gold, nature divination. Reveal any tile within th range three of Arzella. Place a level one outpost on it if it is an unoccupied resource tile. And that's her command ability, but she's not a commander, so she can't use that. Special abilities, werebear, four gold. Arzella has plus two attack and plus two defend until the end of the game round. Ice storm, one wood, one ore. Destroy a level one or two enemy outposts within range two of Arzella. And then Transmorgification, always available. You may convert any of your resources into different resources. And then finally, we have Aranthar Vari, Chieftain of the Two Rivers. Special rules, tough and fortifier. Now, fortifier means that the hero gains one experience when it builds or upgrades an outpost and it gains two experience when it upgrades an outpost to level three and experience is what the heroes use to level up so let's see where were we uh basic ability two rivers cloak aranthar or adjacent heroes ignore one damage that's always available Axe of the two rivers, one wood, and always available. Aranthar or an adjacent friendly hero does a minimum of two damage when attacking. Rites of protection, one gold and two ore, always available. Aranthar's basic ability is extended to range three and ignores three damage instead of one. Rites of command, one gold, one wood, two ore. A friendly hero adjacent to Aranthar may immediately unactivate. Now I start the game with three gold, two wood, and two ore. And these down here are our different uh, possible strategies as we 
play the game, we'll select one at the beginning of each round. And when we select one, we also get to unlock one of these special abilities under that strategy. So the strategy itself gives us some sort of, uh, you know, special rule for that round. And then we also unlock these abilities every time we choose a strategy. And we can kind of go into these in more detail as we play the game. Now, the way I'm going to win the game is by making it all the way up to 10 primacy points. I already have one because of my outpost. You get a primacy point for every outpost you have. The other ways to get primacy points are I can spend two spirits to gain a primacy point. Um, each outpost, <clears throat> excuse me, each outpost of any level is one primacy, as I said. Each level three hero is one primacy. An enemy commander sent in retreat is one primacy, but I don't have any enemy commanders and I don't think monsters count, so that one I won't be able to do. So the main thing I'm going to be looking at are the outposts and the level three heroes, maybe some spirit stuff, but the spirits also could give me these other things if i spend one spirit i can get three of any resource or one spirit to get two attack or two defense dice or spend one spirit to prevent or heal three uh three damage so there's a lot of uses for spirit which is why i might not necessarily use it for primacy but we'll see but these outposts are going to be key the problem with outposts of course is that if they get destroyed i lose that point all right so the way the turn order goes is the a monster goes first, then me, then a monster, then me, then a monster, then me, and then the fourth monster. So in a way, the monsters are going to get two turns in a row because there's only three of me and two of them or four of them. But uh, that also after that fourth one, then we have the end of round stuff happen and I get, you know, some different things can happen there, too. Let's read through the blighter. She's going to be the first one to go. So you can see target. Uh, Tien will always target the closest revealed resource tile that has not been destroyed and is not currently occupied. If all resource tiles are occupied, she will simply target the closest resource tile that is occupied by a juicy target. By the way, a juicy target is any target where the target's defense is not greater than the uh, the uh, the person doing the attacking in this case the monster is not greater than their attack so as long in this case as whatever she's attacking has two or less defense then that's a juicy target for her and and when I say actually juicy target is really only a monster role there's no reason to refer to that for human players anyway uh, so what's about what was that about the juicy target uh, that She'll simply target the closest resource tile that is occupied by a juicy target. All right. If there is no such tile, T1 will not move and has no target. If T1 is occupying a resource tile at any time that is not destroyed, she will use an action to destroy it. Each time she destroys a resource tile, place a counter on her card. If she ever has 10 counters, the game immediately ends and she's declared the victor. But to be perfectly honest, in a solo game, if she gets a 10 counters, I'm in a world of trouble anyway because that is... I think all, I'm pretty sure that's all of my resources uh, if 10 are destroyed. Okay, so as we said, closest revealed resource tile that has not been destroyed, which obviously is this one for her. She has two movement. She will move there. And that's her turn. That's all there is. Now, obviously, next turn, she's going to get there. So I need to make sure that I proactively defend this. Otherwise, she's going to take it out. So that was her turn. So now it's my turn. And I'm going to go ahead and activate... Zotked. So you put this down here to show that he's activated. And I'm going to now, I have two movement. I can spend one movement to scout, which means I just I can just peek at this tile. And then I can choose whether or not to flip it over. Most of the time, especially in the solo game, I'm going to go ahead and flip it over. In a multiplayer game, there's lots of reasons why you might not want to. You might not you know, be able to utilize whatever it is right now, and but you don't want anybody else to know what it is either. Or maybe it's some, uh, something bad and you want somebody else to trip it. A lot of some of the events can be bad for you. So in, in a solo game, most of the time, I'm probably going to flip it over unless it's bad. So anyway, we're going to use one movement to flip this over or to, to look at it. All right, it's a mud tile. So we'll just, we'll go ahead and let that flip over. No reason to hide it. So by the way, mud... A uh, mud tile, whenever a hero uh, enters this tile, they can't move any further during their activation except with a charge through. And uh, what a charge through is, is let's say that 
well, you know what, let's say I'm, I'm going to go here, right? Let's say I attack her and if I do two damage or more, then she's going to fall back. Whenever a tile that I attacked is now empty, I can charge through, meaning I get to move into it uh, almost like a free movement. So, uh, so what this is saying with the mud is that if I was in the mud and I attacked a tile and then that tile became empty, I could then go ahead and charge through it even if I had moved this turn. All right, but anyway, I use scouting to, to reveal that. And now Zotked will move here. And the question is, do I go ahead and attack her or do I build... Do I build a level one outpost there, which will cost me two gold? Now, I want to make sure that I have enough resources because I want to upgrade this to level three right off the bat using this guy, since when he upgrades to level three, he gets two experience points. Um, level three is going to cost me one. Oh, wait, you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to choose a strategy at the beginning of the turn. Now, I'm going to choose this one. Uh, you can see outpost costs one less resource to build, meaning I can choose any resource and uh, subtract one off of it to build or upgrade. Further, any uh, any resource tile occupied by a friendly hero generates plus one resource, even if it has no outpost occupied on it. So it will behoove me to make sure that I have a hero on each available, each of the three available uh, resource tiles by the end of this turn. Now, by choosing this, I get to unlock one of these. So, let's see, we have Geomancy, one gold. After building or upgrading an outpost, the active hero can upgrade it again to level two without requiring an action. Alternative, so now when I, when I unlock it, I can use this side of this token or this side of this token. This side of the token means that this will now cost me one less resource to activate that ability, meaning it will be free now because it normally costs one gold, so it won't cost me anything. Alternatively, this, every one of these is gonna have an asterisk next to a number in it. In this case, level two. Well, this right here, upgrade, uh, uh, basically plus ones, whatever that number is. So in this case, th if I went with the lightning bolt, it would read, after building or upgrading an outpost, the active hero can upgrade it again to level three without requiring an action. Well, I'm gonna go with the free resources because, or making it free by getting rid of one resource because I really wanna focus on getting my outpost out quick and in a hurry. I think that's gonna be key to trying to uh, win this battle. By the way, I have not played against four monsters before. I've played against three monsters when I was learning the game. So I'm bringing this four monster fight to y'all. This will be the first time that I experienced this, so we're gonna see how that goes. But anyway, so that's the one I'm activating. Or rather, I should say that's the one I'm unlocking. Okay, uh, so anyway, now the question is, do I want him to build an outpost there? If I do, that would cost one gold. What is it gonna cost for him to upgrade this to level three? That is one gold, one wood, and two ore, but minus one of any of those. Okay, so yeah, I think we're going to, because if he's here and he has an outpost there, it's gonna, it's gonna cost, it's gonna be difficult for her to have enough attack to get through. Uh, she might be able to deal some damage, but she's not gonna be able to get all the way through and uh, get on a tile. So we're gonna go ahead and build that outpost right now. So like I said, it costs the one gold, put this outpost here, which means I now have two primacy points because every outpost counts as a primacy point. And let's not forget that we have Geomancy, which is free, and now I can automatically upgrade this to level two. Now to do this does not cost an action, but it does still cost the resources. And to upgrade to level two, is one gold and two wood so i can subtract off of one of those i will subtract i'll make it one gold and one wood so there we go okay so just like that we have a level two outpost there which is going to provide some defense as well as two ore at the end of the round and that is zotked's turn. Uh, your characters can move and then do an action. It is interesting though to note that when they move, they they don't have to move all at once. So like I, I can move once, do an action, and then move again. So that is possible in this game. 
All right, so now let's take a look at this Spirit Walker. And he's actually already, something has already happened now because of uh, my using, what did I use? I used, uh, I'm pretty sure that Geomancy is going to cause something to happen here. Let's, let's take a look at this. Okay, so target. The Spirit Walker will always target the closest hero belonging to the player that last used an ability, provided the hero is also a juicy target. Now, I wonder if... Yeah, I would think, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't say a hero's ability, it just says uses an ability. I'm going to say that Geomancy, even though anyone can use that, it, it counts as him using it. Uh, so we're going to say that he did use that. Uh, so he's going to be targeting Zotked. Uh If there is no viable hero belonging to that player, well, okay, so we we'll don't have to worry about that. Once he sends a target hero into retreat, he no longer has a target until another player uses an ability. Each time any player uses an ability, the Spirit Walker gains a level up token. This is what I was talking about, granting it plus one attack. So because Geomancy was used, he's at plus one now. If the Spirit Walker ever sends any six heroes into retreat before it is sent into retreat. The game ends immediately with the Spirit Walker being declared the victor. Place a counter on the Spirit Walker's card each time it sends a hero into retreat and remove them when the Spirit Walker himself goes into retreat. The Spirit Walker will not gain a bonus nor target heroes due to the use of passive abilities. Well, I don't have any passive abilities, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, so the, he is targeting Zotked right now. He has two movements, so fortunately he's not anywhere close so far, but he'll get in there pretty quickly, and like I said, he will really wreak some havoc. So next up, let's go ahead and make sure we get this done. So uh, actually, before before he moves there, we're going to go ahead and scout this. All right, so this is an event. Let's go ahead and flip it over. It is a spirit cache. The player that revealed this tile immediately gains two spirits. So this is really good. These, like I said before, these can be used for attack, promisey points. We're not using them for promisey points yet, but uh, we are going to go ahead and put them in our stockpile and see what we can do with them. They, you know, they also are good for preventing damage and for um, gaining resources. So, so then his other movement, he has two movement. He will move here. And we're going to upgrade that outpost to level three, which, like I said, is going to cost. Uh, we'll go with one gold, one wood, and one ore. So that'll be one less ore than normal. So this goes up to level three. And because Aranthar has the fortifier ability, he gets two uh, experience points. And the way this works is he's trying to get to level, he's currently level zero, right? Or, or no, I'm not sure if you'd say he's level zero, we're trying to get to level one or whatever. Point is, he's trying to level up, and this is the spot that we're trying to fill right now with either defense or attack. And so when he gets one more experience point, you can see that'll cover that spot right there, which is the Roman numeral one. And then that at that point, he will level up. All right, so next up we've got Helgoth. Target, Helgoth seeks to burn outposts to the ground. He will target the closest outpost belonging to the player who has the most outposts in play, which obviously is me. If two or more players have them, forget that. Uh, each time Helgoth attacks his target outpost but fails to destroy it, place a level up token on him, give him plus one attack. These tokens are removed when he successfully destroys his next target outpost or he is sent into retreat. When Helgoth destroys any outpost, take that outpost and place it on his card. It is no longer available for the rest of the game. If Helgoth destroys 10 total outposts, the game ends immediately and Helgoth is declared the victor. Helgoth deals two minimum damage to outposts when he attacks always. So Helgoth is obviously just going to move in this general direction. And we've got our final hero, Azela. I think we want to make sure that she's here, since right now we have Hunt and Gather to get plus one resource. So we'll go ahead and go one, two. Now I think I'm going to turn in one spirit token to gain three gold. And then I'm going to use her basic ability, Nature Divination, to reveal any tile within range three. This is going to cost me one gold to do that. 
So I can reveal any tile within range three. I think we're going to want to get up to the spirit well anyway, so let's let's reveal this one. All right, so it's just an empty tile. If it had been a resource tile, she could have built an outpost automatically on it. Now we did just use an ability, so that means the spirit walker just gained another plus one attack. And now she is here. Oh, by the way, one thing I want to make clear, because uh, I didn't mention it when, during the setup, is that these abilities here are only available as the hero reaches that level. So right now, none of these abilities are available to her, whereas Zodked has one available to him, which is the Primal Rage ability, where he can reroll two dice. Anyway, all right, so she's going to go ahead and build a level one outpost here, which gives me one more Primacy point, puts me up to three Primacy points. And I'm actually going to go ahead and use this other Spirit token to get... One wood, I'll just get one of each. One wood, one ore, and one gold. But I'm gonna spend one gold and one wood to take advantage of Geomancy and go ahead and upgrade that to level two. So that's her turn, and the final turn will be Oriana. Target. Oriana's target is the Well of Power. She will take the shortest possible path to the well, even if there, even if tiles are occupied, going left around impassable terrain, though. If her next tile is occupied, Oriana will instead attack whatever is occupying that tile. Oriana automatically wins any attack, deals no damage, though, but forces the heroes to fall back and destroys any outpost. She will always charge through after attacking. Oriana never performs attacks of opportunity. Attacks of opportunity, by the way, are whenever a monster ends its turn next to a hero or an outpost or another monster, it attacks that thing that's next to. If Oriana has an available action when she enters the Well of Power and there are spirits on it, she will use her action to consume them. The spirits are removed from the board and placed on Oriana's card. Each time Oriana consumes spirits, she performs the scouring the scouring happens immediately upon consumption and causes one damage for each spirit on Oriana's card to all other outposts and heroes within range equal to the number of spirits on her card. If Oriana ever consumes a fourth spirit, she is declared the victor. She discards all spirits from her card when she is sent into retreat. Okay, so she only has one movement and she'll move here. And that is the end of the first round. So at, at the end of the game turn, First, we resolve any end of game turn effects, which we don't have any. Then we determine if anyone's won the game, no one has. Gain resources from outposts. All right, so I'm gonna get two. Uh, remember, I get plus one for all of these because of the heroes being on there and because I chose the hunt and gather option or the hunt and gather strategy. All right, so I'll get three ore, three wood, and four gold. So next, we place a spirit on the Well of Power. By the way, if you end up buying the game and you see this right here, it says place a spirit on the well of power if it doesn't have one already. Uh, and errata has gotten rid of if it doesn't have one already. There's always a spirit placed there at the end of the, of the round. And finally, we'd pass the initiative token to the next player, but obviously solo game. So there you go. That is the setup in the first round of War for Indigar. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. You click the bell, make sure you don't miss anything. We are on Patreon, so please check us out over there. There's links in the description uh, below for that. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.